So are you trying to say this morning for your family, but are you going to the rest of the family of May or your, are you yeah, down here? And my, my wife didn't come to these sessions this morning. Uh, uh, morning. Uh, morning. Every group we got judging each other on it. Hmm? Yeah. Our kids are all going to see the church. I was Oh my goodness. He's a quarterback and he's constantly Wow. Where we go? Wow. Yeah. Yeah, get on the train. He's in the road or something. Yeah. We have a great music program and a great program for our franchise. On Thursday. And yeah, we're real pleased with where Nathan and my son, wife, and his two kids last year. They had a great program. Many great programs. Hey, and I can just tell you. I work out at the Conjunction with the things we've been talking about in this class, an exhibition that is coming to Indianapolis called Stories of Gun Violence from Across America. So I've got cards with some information. If you got one already at the 8 o'clock, let it go by. If you're part of a couple, just take one. So I hope I'll have enough for everybody. Uh, you can get information on the website. As many of you are aware, tragically, of our community has become one of the stories of gun violence. Uh, I'm sure it has been in other ways, but many of you know because Chris Henry has sent a message out to the congregation uh, that over the weekend, um, the son of Joyce Hun, Michael, um, on Friday morning took his own life with a gun and also the lives of his two children uh, who were 13 and 15 years old. 
Uh, it has been a very dark couple of days for our community. And it's just so challenging to talk about these subjects today in the aftermath of having this incident in the life of our community. Um, and yet, this is the reality that we're living in. Uh, and when these things don't affect our communities, they're affecting other communities. Hence, as difficult as it is, I think it simply underscores something we should know all along, how important these conversations are. People have asked in the last couple of days, why? And on Tuesday, I'm leading a Theology on Tap conversation with Owen Gray, where is God when? dot, 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 question mark. As I was thinking that over the last couple days, I thought, I don't really have anything to say except to be silent. I don't have answers. But I appreciated Chris's note, and if you haven't seen it, I wanted to share it with you. Just the one thing we can be confident of in our faith is that in our darkest moments, in our darkest moments, Bob will have a mic, sorry, we didn't have to. God is with us. So I want to read to you a text from Romans chapter 8, and then I'll introduce Bob. Let me read this as a prayer. Romans chapter 8. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. God, as we come before you this morning, we're brokenhearted and in grief. There are no words, but we trust that you are with us even now. We pray for the families affected by this tragedy, the friends, the relatives. May in some way they know your peace. And help us as we have these conversations today and in the days to come. to wrestle with the challenge of making this world and our neighborhood a safer place for ourselves and those who live with us. We ask for Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen. Um, this morning we have Bob Hunter with us, uh, who has some expertise in the area of the questions of human violence and our propensity for that. So just to sort of outline where we've been. We've spent the last couple of weeks talking about gun violence as a public health challenge. We are now shifting to look at the broader questions of violence. So Bob's going to talk broadly about this as a human phenomena and some of the challenges we face. Next week we're going to hone in a bit on a particularly American expression of that violence uh, before we turn our attention to legal questions and thinking about some actions that we might take as a community. So that's sort of the map of where we're going. So it's my privilege to introduce Bob Hunter. Many of you know him. Uh, he works at Center Point Counseling. He's been a pastor. He's been on staff at this church. And I'm honored that he is with us this morning. So let's welcome him. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, Jesus said. Now as the world gives, give I unto you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. <clears throat> One of the most often quoted commands in the life and teaching of Jesus is, Fear not. Do not be afraid. How do we do that in the face of violence and evil 
and threats uh, unimaginable to some of us who live separate from them, that inhabit and stalk the face of the earth. Martin Luther, when in times of distress and trouble, was quoted as saying, my brothers, maybe after a beer or two even, <laughs> my brothers, let us read Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in time of trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. I, I come prepared to talk to you about that strong connection between human fear, human, human beings as fearful <clears throat> organisms that manage our fear with uh, a veneer of thought and culture. Uh, we legislate to constrain that which we fear most in, in societies under the rule of law in Western civilization. But I want to start by this morning going all the way back. Uh, in fact, I, I will show you my title slide, even though I misspelled my last name. <laughs> 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 Please don't tell my mother. <laughs> uh, let's go all the way back to the beginning. I mean, all the way back. Uh, 13, 13 and a half or so on a January 13th, probably. The Big Bang. Uh, and. If we uh, if we say if we start with Genesis, Bereshith uh, bara Elohim, in the beginning, Creator created creation. Uh, then then we we have the broad context in which we as human beings, as part of the fabric of of humanity that inhabits the face of the earth uh, are a part of a flow that began, yeah, that long ago. And, and God is in there, and God is over all, and God is ex giving expression through all to the godness of God, which we have come to know as love in Jesus of Nazareth. Creator creates creation. And down through the eons, planets and stars and galaxies, by the billions, expanding, flowing, all in the presence and power of God, and until a particular planet, the one we're most familiar with, reached a certain threshold where life was formed. Life, or, or, or organic living things. Pretty primitive, pretty microscopic, but there's a new threshold that's, that's crossed as we, and in the span of billions of years, see the advent on planet Earth of, of life. And in the mm. multiplication of those life forms, mm. and the multiplications of the multiplications, life forms, millions of life forms, most, the vast majority of which no longer exist, are extinct on planet Earth. Down through the centuries, we come to a new threshold. Uh, an altogether unique threshold in this one species, in this one life form known as Homo sapiens, is the threshold of human thought. And that's where I imagine when I see the, the picture of creation on the Sistine Chapel ceiling and the finger of God touching Adam, the man, Adam, 
and and then I read Genesis chapter 2 and out of Adama substance what out of what was God created humans and breathed into them the breath of life and man became a living soul and we translate the word nephesh I somehow some days it helps me to, real, to realize, okay, what I'm dealing with here is a bunch of nephesh's <laughs> running around on planet Earth, and we all kind of behave like nephesh's, some days more than others. And that means we've got the breath of God in us and are still trying to figure out what to do with it. How, how do we manage this substance from which God formed us that has so much in common with the natural order with which we are intimately connected and without which we could not exist as humans. We're woven into the fabric of living things on this planet and in this universe. And God breathed into man the breath of life, breathed into Adam, humanity, the breath of life. Uh, this, is, this is not a picture of God. I, I couldn't find one. <laughs> this, is, this is Pierre Teilhard de Chardin. He lived from 1881 to 1955. He's a Jesuit priest and paleontologist who famously is uh, credited with the discovery of Peking Man in, in the Orient, in China. Uh, as one of the missing links in, in evolutionary theory as uh, hominoids and homo sapiens emerged on the planet. And, uh, and so was famous as a paleontologist and also as a priest who after World War II, he was actually stranded in China during World War II by the war and uh, his work, which is entitled The Human Phenomenon. Uh, in, in, uh, I could say it in French, but it would take me five minutes so uh, to get the right pronunciation, so I won't try that right now. The Human Phenomenon, he describes this flow that I've, I'm hinting at, that, that is a God ordered, that God is in there. And, and Chardin really began a serious conversation within the scientific as well as the theological community of uh, an evolutionary process guided by a transcendent power we call God, who, who is transcendent in, in that this, the force of God's loving purposes is woven to, into all of creation, not just our piece of it. And that flow continues on. We may still be in the early morning of this, the life cycle of this universe. We, we are probably in the early morning of the life cycle of the human race as we grow in consciousness. Thought is not, this is a quote from Chardin, thought is not a part of evolution merely as an anomaly or an epiphenomenon. Uh, he's kind of saying, random? Seriously? Uh, but evolution is so clearly reducible and identifiable to the advance toward, I'll put in conscious thought, that the movement of our soul individually and collectively expresses the very progress of evolution. Bob, uh, yes. There are some people who can't hear you. Okay. Your, mic's not, your mic went out. Oh, it went out. I wonder why that, yeah. Hello. Hello. Is it on green? Yeah, it's on green. Hello. Yeah. I, I get, I'm getting a little amplification, but it seemed like it uh, faded. If I, if I raise my voice, I start behaving like a preacher, and I, I don't like that. 
<laughs> you can go, I'll see you. Okay. I'll, uh, you put it just, underneath your tie. I'm pardon sure. me? You oh, put I it did. underneath your tie. That's better. <laughs> yes, I did. Yeah, it has to go on these left handed uh, microphones. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's on the right. Right. Yeah. right way. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I, I, I wasn't hearing myself very well, but um, thank you for prompting me. The human discovers that, and the striking, this is part of the quote from Chardin. Uh, the human discovers that in the striking words of Julian Huxley, we are nothing else than evolution become conscious of itself. Goodness. Uh, there, there are other ways to express that. With the development of conscious thought and the organization of civilized societies, agrarian societies, uh, who came together to, as a collective that is larger than mere family or tribal loyalties, as nation states began to form, religion and culture were inseparable as a part of those nation states. We, we sacralized, that is, we made sacred, the, the values most important to us. And those values, uh, we can plausibly say, are driven mostly by the necessity or the, what we deemed necessary for survival. So we, we organize our values, our norms, our mores, and eventually laws around some form of cooperation with powers beyond our control. The, the management of anxiety and fear is one of the primary functions of those various religious traditions. And to follow the one with which, uh, from which we're descendants, uh, that is Ju uh, Judaism, I'll quote the Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, and by the way, uh, their bibliographies, front and back, two-page bibliographies, that have two works on, uh, on them. There, there are still a few copies back there on the back table, uh, Bill, and if you don't have one, I have a couple of extra copies. Uh, I've, I've presented that bibliography uh, uh, to, to kind of provide some opportunity uh, if you decide where you'd like to go deep to get beneath the story. Not, not all of these authors, uh, authors would be in, in agreement with every statement I make here today. But Rabbi Jonathan Sachs is one of them that I would highlight. Uh, his book, uh, To Heal a Fractured World, is a powerful witness to the core teachings of Judaism that are utterly consistent with the, the core teachings of uh, Christianity through the centuries. Uh, and he's also recently, there's, there's another of his works, Not in God's Name, with which he, in, in which he specifically addresses holy wars, crusades, and other forms of violence carried on in, in God's name throughout history and into a con contemporary society. Eber Bible tells the long and often tense story of the childhood of humanity under the parenthood of God. Mm -hmm. But God does not want humankind to remain in childhood. God wants them to become adults, exercising responsibility and freedom. God asks us only to acknowledge our mistakes and learn from that. <clears throat> Whoops. <clears throat> to be a Jewish child, he says, is to learn to question. Um, I'm not sure that children have to learn to question. My, my <laughs> grandchildren are having me rethink some of these <clears throat> premises. Anyway, I remain in awe at the challenge God has set us to be different iconoclasts of the politically correct. 
to be God's question mark against the conventional wisdom of the age to build, to change, to mend the world until it becomes a place worthy of the divine presence because we have learned to honor the image of God that is humankind. A sacred, uh, a core teaching of a sacred tradition that is a part of our family heritage. Karen Armstrong, in uh, I believe this book came out in 2012 or 14. Karen Armstrong is a British historian, formerly Catholic nun, brilliant and highly respected historian of religion, and has uh, her her book, The Battle for God. I think it's on your bibliography. She had there a number of others worthy of mention. One one of which is uh, the case for God. She takes on the new atheists on their own turf in a, in a, in a very compelling way. But this is uh, in, entitled Fields of Blood, where she is defending, for the most part, she is defending against uh, Dawkins and some of the new atheists who are arguing so vehemently that religion is the source of violence and wars and... and we wouldn't have nearly so much violence if it weren't for religion, so we need to do away with religion and education. She, she makes a compelling case in this book, Fields of Blood, uh, to, the, to the contrary, that religion has been, and Judeo-Christian tradition, the Abrahamic religions, including Islam, have been historically notorious for their constraint of violence rather than their promotion of violence. Though she acknowledges that common to every culture and nation state, the attempt to appropriate religious or godly authorization for their violence, both first in defense and then violence of aggression in the name of God. Is, is also woven into the fabric. So, that, so there, is, there is constantly this chaotic and violent uh, use of religion. And the Third Reich in the 1930s really, uh, so, that, so that the German Christian church under the Third Reich underscored the letter German. When, when I, when I hear people talking about American Christianity or American exceptionalism, I, I hear echoes of when we begin to appropriate our religious authorization for our intentions, however worthy those intentions are, let's be very careful. Let's be careful. I'm not saying let's be reactive. Let's be careful. Let's be thoughtful. Um, <clears throat> in the empires of the Middle East, China, India, and Europe, which were economically dependent on agriculture, as the nation state formed, a small elite comprising more than, not more than 2% of the population, with the help of a small band of retainers, mm -hmm systematically robbed the masses of the produce they had grown in order to support their aristocratic lifestyle. <clears throat> Yet, social historians argue, without this iniquitous arrangement, human beings would probably never have advanced beyond a subsistence level because it created a nobility with the leisure to develop the civilized arts, including education, language, uh, literature, etc. Uh, and, and the sci scientific development that made progress possible. And, and now there's, there's a statement that at first, seeing it, you may think, this is overgeneralized. But the validity of that balance, without this, with, without this organized form of producing a surplus and appropriating it for the great benefit of the few at the expense of the many, 
uh, civilization at least would not have advanced as civilizations have advanced if we if we assume that uh, functioning economies, the rule of law, a military defense of territory, and uh, and and the sciences, the development of scientific methodologies, uh, are in fact a, a progress, a, a progressive uh, factor in the history of civilization. And I do make that assumption, uh, rash as it may seem. The early modern philosophies that tried to pass it down, now we're leaping forward into the 17th century. The early modern philosophies, the philosophies of the Enlightenment and the good, good human beings that rise above nature and control and dominate it, uh, what we've come to know as uh, humanist uh, movements, those early modern philosophers that tried to pacify Europe after the Thirty Years' War, and I'm sure you have intimate familiarity with all of the moving parts in the Thirty Years' War, so I won't, I won't give you that right now. But it was religious loyalty in, in the most violent and extreme form of invasion and defense and alliance, and everybody got involved, and everybody was a victim. Thirty Years' War, uh, now we have a chance to reorganize Europe based upon enlightened, more enlightened principles. But they, as she says, they have a ruthless streak of their own, particularly when dealing with casualties of <coughs> secular moder modernity who found it alienated, alienating rather than empowering and liberating. So uh, this is, this is a, a a bit awkwardly expressed and requires some of her context to kind of fully grasp it, but I put it here in order to say, okay, there's, there's this puzzling struggle that happens once we say these religious holy wars are ridiculous. They're killing us all. And whether we're us or them, we've got to find a new way. Okay, let's all be humans and let's impose, if necessary, on the unwashed, uneducated populations, uh, a new form of order that's based on human values. Uh, and let's put to the sword those who are necessary to eliminate in order to create those societies representing, now this is a century before John Locke shows up on the scene or other political philosophers who are talking about uh, in more practical terms, uh, governments working for the good of all. Although the Apostle Paul uh, was very clear about that in the 12th chapter of Romans, some centuries before. Secularism, as we can call it today, did not so much displace religion, that is, move it off the scene, as create new, new religious enthusiasms. And can you, can you guess, can you anticipate from this vantage point in history what some of those enthusiasms are going to be? What are people going to rally around? Oh, uh, ethnic identity, the nation state that protects their interests, the interests of their tribes, uh, and alliances. So we have this sorting out and reorganizing of tribalism, not necessarily grounded in religious commitment or religious practices. It's, it's about our common human bond. It is about, it's just about us and them. So be very afraid of them. Well, no, we've, we're, we're getting there. <laughs> so, that, so without the foundations of what had been for centuries, our, our religious code of ethics, our common uh, cultural and religious practices, our agreement on what matters most, what augurs for the good of all, 
what honors our tradition and those who have gone before us. Uh, we, we, are, we are thrown back to the human capacity to peacefully order our own lives and our societies. The elevation of the human. Good thing that, okay, it's, it's something really special to be human. True or false? Okay, you've had five seconds, that's <laughs> way more time than you need. How many would say it's true? Humans are born without any innate predisposition toward violence. Okay, how many think it's false? All right, a bunch of Calvinists in the room. Yeah. <laughs> How'd that happen? Theory is sure. I'm 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 going to I'm going to jump into the realm of neuroscience and an understanding of the human organism that uh, I've kind of been swimming in for 30 years and and teaching under the guise of family systems theory and theology and other things. Uh, so that's that's all the warning I'm going to give you. Triggered by fear, desire, and other basic human survival mechanisms, including what René Girard on your bibliography called mimetic violence or imitative, that we are, we are imitative. Uh, we're better than apes are at aping one another. That is what we, what we see working for someone else, we want to appropriate for ourselves whatever it might take to appropriate that. So it's a survival strategy that served us well in some instances. And it's also a survival strategy that can escalate to violent defense against the preservation of what's ours. I got here first. Uh, or the aggression necessary to survive. Yeah, but we're hungry and we need your stuff to survive. And, and out, of, out of those primitive, the, the fear, the desire, and other basic survival mechanisms, uh, we, we are innately, as evolved organisms, uh, capable of predisposition for violence. Now, I, I was much more, before I became a grandparent of two granddaughters. Uh, we, don't, we had one son ourselves, but he has two daughters. And our son was such a peace-loving being, I could, I could really go with the, with the premise that you know, if he, he's going to learn aggression from somewhere else. His two granddaughters <coughs> are, are uh, unfettered, aggressive dominators. <laughs> and I love it. I love watching them dominate the room, even dominating their parents sometimes. I'm glad I'm not having to uh, be the arbiter of, of some of that dominance. But, but the, the, the aggression is, is a part of the energy. I mean, we can identify neurotransmitters and hormones and all kinds of natural substances that, that, that contribute to this aggressive tendency that is innately human. Now I'm going to go back to T.R. de Chardin. If, if we put this fearful, aggressive, thoughtful thing that called a human being into this long flow of history, as a part of the progression of God's activity within time and space. How, how do we make sense of that? We see humans as a work in progress. Then we might catch a glimpse in both directions as we look into our deep past and as we peer out into the future, based on our direction thus far, 
where are we headed? What, what are some of the next uh, levels of possibility in human development? We see ourselves as a work in progress, then we might catch a glimpse of our source and our destination. The, we, we, we arrive at where we've been and recognize it for the first time, in the words of T.S. Eliot. And the flow of God's love, like a vast ocean that engulfs us, here and now, carrying us toward unity with God and unity with one another. And it is through our conscious participation in this flow, which is love, made known in Jesus Christ our Lord, in Romans 8, uh, that, that represents and empowers this flow. Uh, just quoting from Isaiah, to that point where the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of God as the waters that cover the sea. I have to talk briefly about the triune brain. Uh, Dr. Paul McLean, back in the 1980s, came forth when there was lots of conversation in the 80s about, are you right brain or left brain? Are you intuitive or analytical? And that's really an important distinction to make, and I don't want to minimize it. it, there's, it it's true. But the really important distinction is new brain, midbrain, reptilian brain. The R complex, the reptilian brain, is we possess. We we have them. We we have them in common with reptiles and all other uh, life forms that have evolved, have evolved since reptiles have the R complex brain. All all that part of the brain distinguishes largely through the amygdala, still a structure in the brain, uh, is safety danger. Safe danger. And in that, that part of the brain, and in the, the midbrain that we have in common with all mammals, uh, that Paul McLean called the limbic system, there's been controversy about you know what's included and what's not included in the limbic brain as mammal. Uh, the study of uh, brain science, uh, studying mammals and some of the differences between different species of mammals. Uh, but that part of the brain is about bonding. Uh, once we've determined safety danger, we bond, we defend, we have a social consciousness among the mammals. Reptiles eat their babies. They're as likely to eat them as they are to defend them. All, all the reptile brain says is, is safer danger and automatic response is out of here or attack. So the, the mammalian brain has, has, is much more complex and it sits right in the middle of our central nervous system. And it is, it, it is uh, very alert and sensitive, especially through the visual and the olfactory uh, senses, uh, responds to not only safety danger, but what's safe and dangerous to us and ours. So, so the defense of, of the most dangerous mammal is the one whose young is threatened, a mama bear. I've, I've encountered one a uh, time or two with cubs. Mm -hmm. The conventional wisdom when you grow up in Montana is never mess with the cubs because mama's somewhere near. <laughs> I've learned that's true also on the playground sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> The, uh, the, the neocortex, that is the new brain, that is almost completely unique to humans. There, there are traces of neocortex, what we call cortex, in some other primates. But the, uh, the neocortex is the thinking cap, the, the, the surface of the brain that's mostly up, up toward the front and the top. 
And, and that's the part of the brain in which thinking, anticipation, analysis, intuition, executive functions, including impulse control. So the executive brain is like the conductor kind of trying to monitor and keep on in harmony the rest of the orchestra, which is down here going, hey, I'm going to try this. Oh, she looks nice. No, he looks bad. Uh, who's good? Who's bad? The executive brain going, oh, everybody take a breath. Calm. Let's, let's think about this. Still, what, this, what the neocortex is getting, and the more conversations, I've, it's, it, this has spanned 30 years, and I, I don't want to try to count the number of research neuroscientists I've, I've uh, been in dialogue with during that time, but it's quite a few. And, and there's, there's this careful ascent to, yeah, somewhere between 10 and 15 times the number of connections that, that provide information to the executive brain, then there are connections from the executive brain, the dendrites, that lead from the executive brain to the emotional part of the brain. So if, if you're frightened of someone, if someone has harmed you, uh, and even if it's just hurt your feelings, you imagine they have harmed you, it, it, that means that, yes, it will probably take about 10 to 15 experiences of that person as a source of pleasure, alliance, safety, in order to get back to a neutral experience of that person. Uh, uh, which helps to explain why children in conflicted households, for example, where mom and dad just can't get along and under some circumstances may even resort to violence, live in a permanent state of alarm. They are not safe in that context. There, there is way too much input that says, you're in danger, you're in danger, you're in danger, which floods that <clears throat> bring that body with stress hormones, cortisol, which turns out is a very toxic substance. Uh, we, we develop tolerance for it if we live under stress conditions for long periods of time, but then lose the capacity to manage it. It's like an addiction. It's to be used uh, in Robert Sapolsky's book, Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers uh, on Your Bibliography, is a wonderful visual picture of this. Cortisol is what the zebra needs to run for a very short period of time, fast enough to escape the lion. Uh, but the reason zebras don't get ulcers is their brain shuts down, they don't remember the lion all that much, hmm. and they live in the moment. Uh, humans, humans are not only going to remember, but, but escalate the threat. And by the time they finish telling the story around the campfire, the lion had them in its jaws and they barely escaped. Uh, so so we've got, we have the capacity to escalate the, the level of threat, of real threat. So those messages that say to us, be very afraid. And, and you can fill in what, what the, the stressor is that's supposed to make us very afraid. Uh, fear is a, it, it spreads like a virus. And arms a whole group for reactive response. Uh, difference is danger to the old brain. Difference is danger, especially visual difference. If you look different, act different, if my, if my optical apparatus sends information that this isn't one of us, that, that object, especially that person, is suspect 
until proven otherwise. That's, that's human nature. That, that's not, it's culturally formatted, but, it's, but it goes across cultures as an organic reality about what it means to be human. So, so here's, here's what we're up against. We have all of this stimulus and executive brains to regulate our reactivity that are in process, but still with major challenges to calm and focus and engage in thoughtful action. And, and, I, and I do that because thoughtful is not a fast thing. Daniel Kahneman, on your, on your bibliography, talks about thinking fast and slow. Kahneman is himself a Nobel Prize winner in economics. Uh, and and has th this book is a wonderful exposition of, of, uh, about the impulsiveness of human nature. That slow thinking and fast thinking are all part of thinking. They're, they're, they're still thought. There's cogn cognition. <clears throat> But the emotional brain has the habit of hijacking the thinking brain. Uh, and, and, and when we when our thinking is mobilized in the defense against a perceived threat, then, then we have a contaminated uh, breach of consciousness. We think this is a thoughtful thing. I just feel so strongly about it because it's so rational. Jonathan Haidt, hate <laughs> is how it's spelled, H-A-I-G-H-T, on your bibliog bibliography. Uh, wonderful uh, book that, uh, that describes how this works out in societal uh, and, and, and the various bases upon which conservative and moderate and liberal in a public and public discussion are, are rooted in specific motivating factors like how important is loyalty, how important is compassion or concern for the other, and so on. It's six or seven different scales that, that he presents in very, a very lucid fashion in that book. Can we all agree then that Christian communities have a significant role to play in the constraint of violence within the secular, the society in which we reside. And that's, that, that may seem like a leap from where we've gone so far, but if we could talk about have Christian cultures have, as the church generally had some role to play in constraining violent resolution of conflict within and between societies. I think, I think we can answer that and say, well, there's evidence on both sides, but in general, yes. But here and now, if we hear the voice of Jesus say, come follow me, how do we exercise that role in a secular society that, that is constructed to preserve intrusions from the government on religious practices, but also intrusions from religious organizations on government policy, that is, uh, domination? Many voices should be heard, including the voices of religious traditions those who claim the authorization of God. The prevention of violence and avoidance of any and all <clears throat> unnecessary violence is at the very heart of Christian life. Agree? Disagree? I, I, I put it out here as a, a hypothesis that I embrace with my heart and mind at this point.
I'm not going to go there right now. I want to wrap up with Taylor. Someday after we have mastered the winds and waves, the tides and gravity, we shall harness for God the energies of love. And then for the second time in the history of the world, mm. humanity will have discovered fire. L'chaim to life. Uh, Marsha Hutchinson, that some of you may know, uh, here at Second Church, uh, gave me this picture, oh, 20 years ago, uh, that she took in her driveway that had just been paved with about four inches of asphalt. There's a little, little crocus showing up in the spring <laughs> against all the odds. Again, Teilhard, let us therefore bow with respect under the inspiration swelling our hearts for the anxieties and joys of trying everything and finding everything. The evolutionary wave we feel passing was not formed in ourselves. It comes to us from very far, having started out at the same time as the light of the first stars. It reaches us after having created everything on the way. The spirit of research and conquest is the permanent soul of evolution. And he's not referring to violent conquest here. He is talking about mastery of the reality in which we are embedded and of which we are a part. <clears throat> Let us pray. Lord, make me an instrument of thy peace. Where there is hatred, let us so love. Where there is injury, let us so pardon. Where there is discord, union, where there is doubt, faith, where there is despair, hope, where there is darkness, light, and where there is sadness, joy. O Divine Master, grant that we may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen. Amen. I thought uh, St. Francis might be one of the hardest people for anyone to rebut, but uh, if anyone <laughs> who wants to take St. Francis on, or Pope Francis. Questions? Uh, yes, Judy? Uh, we're talking about the church and the Christian enemy. There are two common denominations uh, in total. The two denominations stand out in my mind as being thought of as peace churches, it's Mennonites and the Quakers. Mm -hmm. Maybe the others I can't think Yes. Of and so, several different so varieties of each. All the rest of the denominations are not peace churches. <laughs> uh, well, I would make a distinction between peace churches and pacifist yeah. churches, yeah. where the dogma of uh, the, the necessity of nonviolence. Uh, which is pretty consistent with the life and teaching of Jesus of Nazareth, I might add, uh, is, is a, a core belief to which they subscribe and, and practice sometimes at great cost to themselves in, in various Western cultures. Uh, I don't know. Uh, does that mean that the rest of us aren't? Peace churches. Um, the the intentional, and I think the Franciscan. Uh, I learned a great deal from a dear friend, now deceased, uh, Father Tom Fox, who's a Franciscan, and uh, and uh, a person who embodied the spirit of Saint Francis. I feel that. Uh, he could he could sit amongst a fairly violent community of Christians, <laughs> to, both literally and figuratively, I guess, and and be respectful and hopeful and and also consistent with his own uh, his that that spirit that will not attempt to impose on you what is rightfully yours to choose or decide is a part, of, I think, of that pacifist tradition. And I've certainly experienced it. My mother 
grew up in the Quaker uh, heritage. Um, so, yeah, Jim? Well, I was going to ask another question. Yeah, please. Do you believe that non-fearfulness can be taught? One of, the, one of the key elements of leadership I've taught for a long time is uh, the capacity to accurately detect threat to, an organiz to the organization one leads, family, tribe, congregation. I, I believe, I, I've, I've watched at Eagle Creek Park uh, a doe, a mother deer, with two fawns. Mm. When I'm riding my bike years ago, early in the morning, and that, that doe is out there grazing at the roadside where she's accustomed to grazing and cars can roll by slowly and she doesn't jump into the brush like her whole alarm system is telling her to do. She's, she has adapted. But what about her fawns? They, they, have, they are hardwired to jump into the bushes and run as far as they can. But I can, it, so here's this big thing moving rapidly toward them on a bicycle. That's me. <laughs> and, uh, and I'm watching so carefully and the fawns are twitching and looking up. But, but they're, where they're looking is at mom. Uh, at least after the first couple of weeks. And, and mom looks at them, just continues grazing, and says, fear not, I am with you. Nothing to fear here, he's harmless. Jennifer? So I think part of it comes from really a belief about that all humans are created by God and mm -hmm. the sanctity of life. And when you put those two together, mm -hmm. I think that you can then begin to uh, do a little bit less of those that othering yeah we, and yeah. so I think for us as Christians one of and for really us as humanity one of the key things is to really um, focus on especially for those people of faith to focus on the uh, the idea that we're all created by God and it, as such when I approach my fellow human beings as God's creations, right. then I'm less likely, at least I've been working through this mental exercise for probably the last five or 10 years, mm -hmm. um, I'm less likely to other them and more likely to um, <coughs> include them. So I think one of, the cool, one of the things that we really have to do is really think about some of the divisiveness that comes from us as Christians and really, how does that theological idea that we are all created as God's children, how do those really work together? And maybe they don't. So to me, that's like answering Jim's yeah. question a little bit. Like, can we actually rise above and use more of our intellect to think? Right. It can only be done thoughtfully and intentionally. Maybe a generalization we could make. I don't know how that strikes you. Well, I, I think what you were saying is mm -hmm. modeling, and I think what Jennifer was saying, using being aware of our neocortex uh, to think through um, mm -hmm. all the things that you're saying. Mm -hmm. Bob, that, that assumes you have the time. The physics of the situation may not give you the time. And, the, and that's where that, that it, it is the issue of time that, that becomes so critically relevant to the, the whole gun violence debate. What we have uniquely with the, with the advent, especially of a handgun, is uh, a seconds between perception of threat and lethal, the use of lethal force. And that's why law enforcement and military go through the most rigorous training and constraint. Everyone who owns a handgun, I believe, should learn and to practice, because it takes a lot of practice, the same rules of engagement 
that a law enforcement officer must be trained to do before he or she goes on the street with lethal force in tow. Uh, because those rules of engagement uh, call upon them to do a fairly unnatural act. Uh, feeling threatened is not a sufficient warrant for the use of lethal force. <clears throat> And I, I would put that maybe in the category, of, in some sense, of a spiritual discipline. Yes. There are a lot of things that we know we do on autopilot yeah. Yeah. that aren't good for us spiritually. Mm -hmm. And if we take our faith seriously, then we have to start disciplining ourselves in little things. I'm, I'm not saying that, exactly. that we don't react in some very serious situations even if we've had a lot of spiritual discipline. Mm -hmm. But I think many of us have never tried to submit. I would say the one thing that the peace churches do mm -hmm. is encourage that kind of spiritual discipline. Well, and, and that's where even in the practices of worship, my, my thinking over the years goes in the direction of what I, I don't know very many people who need to go to worship into worship on Sunday in order to be stimulated. I know lots of people who do go in order to be stimulated again, what, but at least with all of the stimuli and, and pro provocation to thoughtful response, where do we find the time to calm and focus? to take the time and engage in the spiritual disciplines that are available to us, meditation and reading and pray, corporate, uh, corporate acts of, of, of silence, of thoughtful okay. engagement. Bill, you had a question. As you started this class this morning, at the beginning, one could argue that the Big Bang was a violent episode. Mm -hmm. One could say that a mother giving birth is a does violence to her body. Uh, certainly we have violence throughout nature, floods, wildfires, tornadoes that we're most accustomed to. God choosing our redemption through a rather violent act perpetrated on Christ. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about our human culture, I, I'm, where does all that fit in, Bob, to what we're saying? Thank you. Uh, again, on your bibliography, Gil Bailey's book, Violence Unveiled presents a theology of the cross as the reversal, the fundamental reversal of violence as a religious act so that the victim is a, it is the powerlessness of God on the cross for redemptive purposes that expresses the depths of love's flow which conquered is conquering violence and death. And he, he does a beautiful job of appropriating the work of René Girard that's also on your bibliography. And Girard it, it has, it has had a lot of effect and impact. Uh, was at Stanford University uh, on the faculty for a considerable period of time, although he's uh, French. Uh, but Gil Bailey summarizes it powerfully and beautifully, and I, I couldn't recommend more highly any resource that addresses that. Yeah, I, I have to say, in the flow of God's purposes, violence is, and, and catastrophic tragedies of all kinds, is in there. It's part of it. It's not because God didn't have the power to do it differently. It's not because God, uh, it, God had taken my advice, would have done it differently. Uh, it, it is 
it is what it is. And, and, and the flow toward that day when the kingdoms of this world shall become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, they came about through the emptying, not through the domination of Christ. So, yeah, yeah that's, that's a wonderful bottom line. And, and I know we're over time, so... Thank you for uh, your patience and your contributions, and let's keep thinking about it together. Thank you, Bob.